Hello everybody, Adam here again with a quick announcement before we get going that our Big 3 giveaway is still going on and you still have a chance to enter and win one of our fabulous prizes. As mentioned, there's going to be three winners for this giveaway, one for each of the milestones that we're um, either hitting or about to hit and if you want to win, here's how you do it. There's going to be a pinned post, like the post, follow the show and retweet or share that post using the hashtag FMPodBig3. The winners will be drawn in a week's time and announced at the start of our next episode, which is the Prinkles' Excellent Adventure. If you want to double your chance of winning, our Patreons are automatically entered and you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash forcemajeurepod for as little as $1 a month and get access to all of the excellent random stuff that we put on there as a little extra way of saying thank you. Right, Let's not keep you waiting any longer. You know how it goes. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. You're listening to Force Majeure, an actual play Star Wars podcast. My name is Adam and I'm your host and I'm joined round the table by... Hi, I'm Mikey. Hi, I'm Mim. Hi, I'm Ed Fortune. I'm Ross. Hello. Uh, none of us get a surname except Ed, by the way. I know that you, that, that is one of the questions. This is the second uh, question and answer session episode, uh, the Quickfire Chronicles. Thank you, Ross. And we're going to try and get through them a little bit quicker because we still have a massive pith helmet full of your lovely questions. So let's get started with Ross. The question I've drawn out is from Halo the Panda King. Great name. To Jay Ren. What colour will the new arm be, or what colour do you want it to be? Well, to be honest, um, um, Halo. Uh, it, it's not really up to me, because I'm not making it. However, I would probably like it to be blue, you know, a normal skin tone. Um, but um, I think it's going to be... What What colour is the robot arm we have? Metallic. Tarnished. I think it's going to be metallic. And we, we, we put a fair bit of wire wool over it, so I'm, yeah, I'm hoping it's less tarnished than it is than it was. But no, blue. Evil. From Lou to everyone, which advert is your favourite? I have to say, let's go to the hut. Hey, baby, let's go to the hut. Uh, Port Haven, just because it's become a meme in our household that if, if anyone mentions Port Haven, Port Haven. <laughs> that happens and I, I love it. So I have to still love that advert. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mim to repeat this because she does it a lot better than I am. But I'm going to say, this love cat is alone <laughs> this loth cat is alone always makes me sad uh for me it's blue mountain death sticks i i love blue mountain death sticks and i love the aline voiceover actor yeah. who did blue mountain death sticks and also frenchy boingos and will almost certainly be appearing in more adverts going forward my favorite advert that hasn't been released yet is one that's going to be coming in season four and uh, it just it's it was wonderful um, you're, I'm getting a bit of a blank look. You'll find out in due course. Yeah. Needless to say, I don't remember recording it, yeah. and you'll probably be able to work out which one it is when you hear it. So, um, yeah, there we are. I have, I have a second choice, a very, very close contender, and it is the Captain Codfish advert. Yes. Oh, Buy my stuff. stuff. Buy my stuff. <clears throat> For that one, I know we're supposed to be going quick fire. Min was away doing a LARP at the time, yeah. so I'm sitting in our recording studio by myself, and I did about 20 different versions of me going, are you ready, kids? And I went out of the uh, the house um, the next day, and the the neighbour, you could tell he hear, heard me. You can tell he, he was wondering what hell I was doing because we had a very stilted conversation. Are you all right, Mikey? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, that's good. Um, you, you, Mim not around? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, next question. Uh, from Permaflame to Adam, what inspired you for the storyline? Ooh, so Port Haven was where I needed the party to go to meet Hawker to get... That, that was just seeding the story, really. And the whole hunt thing was more because I knew Oberon. So that was more reaction to player events. The cost of the Baron, the first kind of inspiration was that I'd been wanting to do a horror story in a tabletop game for ages. I'm not normally very good at them, but I, I just... I, I had an idea and I couldn't quite shake it. One of my favourite films is Event Horizon. I absolutely love Event Horizon. It is good. 
And that kind of atmosphere when they're on there, before it all goes really left field right at the end and the horror becomes quite overt, that initial kind of creeping sense. I like my horror films that are psychological. I like that creeping sense of dread. And that's what I wanted to get across with the Cost of the Bar and plotline. So yeah, Event Horizon was the initial, and I suppose a bit of Alien and Aliens as well with that there are threats out there, they are fast, they're hard to see, it's claustrophobic, it's dark. So yeah, that that was my inspiration. This is from Blame Cat to all the players. Are your characters where you expected them to be at the end of the chapter? No. Yes. Nope. Yes, that was the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask the two people who said yes, did they expect us to be exactly in those physical locations? <laughs> Well, we were going there. We were going to a temple. <laughs> yeah, that's my point. <laughs> and, and we knew where we were going. We didn't know that there was a temple there, but um, Duran doesn't think that far ahead. So when it just means he's not confused by things because he's always in, in the moment. Mm. So, yeah. Do we but, think Blame Cat meant, you know, emotionally? I think he probably meant emotionally <laughs> in terms of your character arc as oh, opposed to geo, no, geospatial <laughs> looking. No, Obron passed his astrogation exam. <laughs> he bribed someone, but he did pass his astrogation exam. I mean, you uh, did you did the astrogation. You knew exactly where we were going. <laughs> uh, no, it was Tugger. Oh, yeah. Tugger did it all. Mm. Maybe you told me you did it. I don't know. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> Oberon did to Port Haven. Yeah. Um, and getting oh, out it was of already... and Daxos. Tugger yes. did it from Port Haven. You were in the tube at the time, yeah. You, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, but emotionally, not from the start of the season, because the whole bit about getting into the healing side of things wasn't because we needed a healer, but it was because that Jiren kept feeling useless when we got into Ruckus's. So it, it was kind of like that. So emotionally, I wasn't expecting to turn my my character into a into somebody who focused on, on healing or anything like that. I had three different directions I could take the character in, and... I kind of, as stuff happened, I, I leant towards one. So so the the cheaty answer is yes, but then I had multiple expectations. I could say during the cost of the bar, I think I expected him to be trying so hard to protect people and smash what he could that he was going to be the the one, the first one to pass out and not the only one of the four who didn't. Okay, this is also one from Blame Cap, who sent us loads, uh, as he did with the Hiding Heroes, because, you know, thank you, Chris. We do appreciate it, by the way. We just got a lot from you. What is one crossover event you have yet to do that you would love to see? Or, um, for me, I would love a crossover between the Cold Fire Chronicles team mm-hmm. and the Dice for Brains Barva Chronicles at the point, at the end of Dice for Brain Season 3, yeah. where they've defeated Rowan, uh-huh. before they then time skip and go back to Barva, and they all kind of start going their separate ways. Yeah. And then, so at the end of the, the, the Dice for Brain's Barva crew, at the end of Season 3, meeting the Cold Fire crew, pretty much where they are now, at, at the start of well, what will be Chapter 3 of the Cold Fire Chronicles, when they've come out of the Jedi Temple, and have gone a bit further down that path, that crossover is what i would like to see i think that would be some very interesting i would love to see for example gree and uh, gree tickets and lassa yeah. talking about designs for stuff yeah i think it would be very interesting seeing zen and um jiren discussing force philosophies and i think it would be very interesting to see how bear would react to agatha and oberon yeah, I think that'd be some really interesting dynamics. Um, I feel that a, and we've talked about this on Twitter a few times, but a heist um, series with Duran and um, Roy and Tychus and Varun uh, from Heroes and all the Empire is around by Click from Sil Zero. And I think that would be an amazing team for us to do something terrible. Uh, I'm always up for exploring the galaxy and I'm always up for crossovers. So the short answer is hit me up. Yeah. Uh, the longer answer is uh, just cut in a, a maniacal cackle because I have thoughts on how story is structured in Star Wars and I'll leave it there. Okay, next question. From Leslie to anyone. What's the average tea consumption per DM? Um, Cost-wise or on, on number? <laughs> I think probably how many mugs of tea. And kind of. during a, a, a game session, um, we tend to do four episodes a, a session, so one beforehand and then one each in between each one, so probably five. Yeah, that's about right. Yep. Yeah. 
And none for me because I don't drink tea. Uh, I would like to point out that there's also the difference of cup size, which you need to take into account when doing this, because I prefer to have my tea in pint mugs uh, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the little dainty porcelain teacups that you might be picturing us British types having with a little biscuit on the side. Uh, Mugs, proper big mugs of tea. Mm. So when I'm writing, I tend to do a thing where I'll stop and do something else. One of the easiest things to stop and do is make a cup of tea and then that lets my brain catch up and then I'll come back. And quite often I'll be three cups of tea growing cold. Oh, because quickly, cold. quickly for our British listeners, there's a cup of tea going cold somewhere. Go and get it. Yep. <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> tea is the punctuation in the book of life. It is important. It my, is- my book of life has got a lot of run on sentences then. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, it does. actually this works. <laughs> Our lives have full stops, yours has a comma, mm-hmm. and semicolons and things, and M dashes. Next question. Which actor or actress would you want to portray your characters if Force Majeure would be a live action film or TV series? And who asked us that? That was asked to us from Paul Menz to everyone. Well, I, I know what my answer is straight away, and it's because this actor has done really well at portraying stuff before, and... It's Judy Walters, because I think I, I've seen her do grumpy characters. She's very good at them, but she's got this inner warmth that I think would have come from Lassa's previous life, from being, uh, she's just a really good actress at doing slightly older women in a variety of spectrums. Mm-hmm. I could go for Dame Maggie Smith, because I think she would be a perfect Granny Weatherwax, but I think that that little bit of, of being slightly shorter, slightly more uh, physically built rather than just tall and, and really slender to give her a bit of that bustling. Rah, 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 rah. You can imagine her bustling through a spaceship. I think she did a really good job. Uh, Duran looks like uh, Cary Grant and always has done. So uh, unfortunately, Cary Grant isn't acting anymore because he's dead. But if you've ever seen New Girl, Max Greenfield. I think has that right sort of emotion. Looks a little bit like to how Duran is, but blue. I have no one in mind at all when I play Agatha. Um, Dave Bautista was the obvious choice, and then I was thinking Christian Bale as Batman. That's the sort of voice he seems to have. But um, but whether Christian Bale would shave his head, turn green, and you know, I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd get the physique because that's what Christian Bale does. But so the character of Oberon is a mix of Zuko from from Avatar and uh, Lucius Malfoy. So either the voice actors or the actors who played those characters I have in mind. But if I was actually casting, and I'm going to go for one that will send you all to IMDb, I'd go for an actor called Mike Beckingham. Uh, he does mostly uh, horror movie roles, and he's a, a thin, rangy kind of guy. And he's very good at doing charming, and he's very good at doing creepy. And he's just got that kind of aura about him that you can just see him being that kind of he's very good at doing the mania behind the eyes if you see what I mean there's a lot going on in the background with his roles if you see what I mean so I think in my head if I was casting roles it'd be Mike Beck in them. When I when I saw your artwork before um over on the first thing that I saw was Spike from Buffy so James Masters and I was like oh, okay it's a posh Tory boy James Masters in yeah. space okay next question this is from Halo the Panda King and this is for me Lassa if you could have any ship or build your own what would it be and what would it have she would very much like and I, I had a, a good look at things she'd quite like if it's pronounced correctly a Nyaba class cargo barge driver and they are capable of pulling huge amounts of pods or uh, barges with other things on them. So and, and there's a, a famous person who's managed to get 30 barges attached and travel. Because really, it only needs two crew as a minimum crew. And you can do that with one person and one droid. Or one person, one droid and Prinkle. And she wouldn't have to deal with anybody. She'll just travel from one end of the galaxy to the other doing little jobs. Uh, so yeah, it'd be... Uh, one of those models, probably customised so she could beat the record of barge dragging. I love the idea that it's an advantage that you don't have to hang out with anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Just you, you're a, you're a lighthouse captain in space, really, aren't you? Yeah, only she'd probably turn the lighthouse off because it's <laughs> it's keeping her awake. That's the happily ever after for one of our characters. I'm not. Does anybody else have a happily ever after for theirs? Try and stay on the script of the questions we've got, please, <laughs> 007. <laughs> Probably there. There we go. Having a, a very small crew in a lovely job where she doesn't have to worry more than usual about the Empire. 
Uh, Duran's Happily Ever After, by the way, just as a side, is exactly the same as that, but with um, Agatha there with you. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Because that would be really funny. That, that's just Red Dwarf, the, the, yep, the it serious is, it is. That's not. Yeah, that's not Happily Ever After. Oberon doesn't have a Happily Ever After. It's kind of the point at the moment. There's no happy ending to this one. Yeah. So a very quick one uh, from Blamecat to everybody. Would you ever consider a musical episode? Yes. 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 No. We'd have to script a lot of it, but Mim would come up with most of the songs halfway through anyway. So. Friendship is a power sword. I was going to say, we, we've had musical episodes. It was a Tiny Tigers adventure. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't seen Tiny Tigers, go and watch it because it's awesome. Uh, because I'm awesome. Do you really want 30 minutes of very bad filk? Yes. Also, you've not heard me play the ukulele. There's a reason for that. And we thank you. Okay. Uh, next question is from Mr. T to the whole cast. Uh, which of you is planning to turn to the dark side? And I suppose planning is a strong planning. word. Um, when you say to the whole cast, do you mean players or uh, characters? Because players and characters are a different question for me. Um, I don't know. Why want to answer it both? <laughs> like, as in like do you, which of you as a player is intending to turn to the dark side and which because I, I suppose actually your, your characters generally aren't intending to mm-hmm. fall i imagine that it's just a consequence of what they do yeah. but are any of you i suppose uh, and i'm sorry for misinterpreting your question here uh, mr t are any of you intending to fall to the dark side or is it just going to be a consequence of how you're playing your characters Duran is not intending to fall to the light side if that helps yeah. Uh, but he's not intending to fall to the dark side. There is a uh, there's a balance of the last bit of um, morality chat. Yeah, I'd like to stay around fifty. Mm. You know, something bad, something good, something in between. I'm not intending for Agatha to fall to the dark side. She's doing very, very well at it. Fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> Stop yeeting party members into death. <laughs> oh, honestly, for for Oberon, he he doesn't know what those are. <laughs> yeah, but. But Ed, let Roy write a little song to explain. <laughs> but you, as Ed, I, I imagine that you're quite the opposite. You're trying to get to the. You're trying so to become a light. I, I would quite like the character to become a light sider. However, he's got a long way to go, and me, me, the player, will make it as difficult as possible for everyone to get to the light side because that's more interesting to play than, than simply just going. Oh, I do all the right things. No, 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 no. If mm-hmm. there was an opportunity to mess it up. Oberon will take that life choice. This explains a lot. <laughs> yeah. Ed, you, you can you can stop doing that after we finish the game <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've met me. Yeah, that's fair. I think Lass has made it pretty clear in game that the light side and the dark side, they mean nothing to me. She wants the middle path. Uh, she she really really believes that there can't just there must be another way you know other than all my banks becoming trendy wine bars there's some retro advertising for you from British people <laughs> but but yeah I think it's been pretty obvious she doesn't like the light side because she thinks Jedi's were all up themselves and probably bad people and the dark side is clearly bad people as well uh, she wants that middle way that uh, Mm, that green way, shall we say, possibly. We, we just need to find uh, something that's voiced by Tom Baker. Yeah, uh, always. Agatha thinks this goes from 0 to 50 or on 0 to 100 at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> Agatha's not aware of the top half of this scale. Yeah. You're aspiring to the middle. That's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the phrase, differently good. And I've played yeah. plenty of differently mm-hmm. good characters. Uh, and I've played lo- plenty of very evil characters who have been described by other people as differently good. Yeah. Up to the point that I've literally led them into the sacrificial pit. This is a LARP, obviously. I'm, yeah. I'm not a murderer. But you yeah. say that. <laughs> okay. okay, next question. Next question. From Lou to everyone, what's your favourite mid-game biscuit? What are your character's favourite mid-game biscuits? Ooh. Chocolate malted milk. That's my favourite. That's not What we should qualify as well is, I'm aware, especially in America, that an American biscuit is very, very different to a British biscuit. Um, just look at the biscuit baron. Yeah. I imagine that because yeah, it's it's like a weird almost scony thing. I think yeah. over there. for American listeners, we mean cookies. Except when we say cookies, in which case we specifically mean chocolate biscuits with chocolate chips or raisins or something in them. Duran doesn't like biscuits <gasps> because you know they're all as vices go. It's kind of a kind of a amateur hour. All right. So when Pringle gives you your tea and biscuit, who gets your biscuit? Um, Pringle does about ten minutes later. Okay. Mm. Um, Oberon prefers flat, bland biscuits, mostly for travel. Um, sugary is fine. Lember spread. 
<laughs> it's it's just what he's used to. So like the kind of bis- the kind of shortbread that you get in a ration pack. So he prefers the shortbread, but they don't call it space shortbread. Whatever Star Wars is called shortbread. Uh, me, I, I like a nice chocolate digestive. Who doesn't? Agatha probably likes jammy dodges, but he'll, but while binge watching Heights and Depths, he'll be on the pink wafers. Ugh. Oh, pink wafers are the, the, no wonder you're falling for the dark <laughs> Biscuit monster. <laughs> the biscuit. Oh, that's got to be something we come up against at some point. The biscuit monster. The, I think that's from custom. Sesame Street, isn't it? Quick, <laughs> dunk him in the tea. Dunk <laughs> him in the tea. My one weakness. There is a biscuit monster. Yeah, it's Carl from Here Is The Hiding Way. <laughs> no, no, the, there, yeah. is, there is a biscuit monster. He's the cookie monster's British cousin. He looks oh, exactly gosh. the same as the cookie monster, except he has a baller hat. Because that's how you know we're British. We no, all wear those. That is true, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> uh, Lass's favourite is probably a digestive, because that's something which you, would, would stay on ships quite a long time. A chalky digestive, mm. because she's got that mentality of, there's digestives for everyone, but if you have a special guest or if you're trying to impress, you bring out the chalky digestives. We're learning a lot about the characters, aren't we? <laughs> My favourite biscuit is, is actually kind of bland because I'm diabetic. Um, big love to diabetic homies out there. I have a great love for rich tea because it, you can dunk them and you can just sit and nibble them. And if if you want a chocolate biscuit, put some Nutella on it. Believe me, it works. You, so you, so it can. it's a very versatile biscuit. Okay, next question. And no one no one else nicks them. It's amazing. You get custard creams out or chocolate bourbons, good luck getting in there, mate. They are gone. They are gone before you can even have a lick. And then 45 minutes of biscuit talk. <laughs> That's the way the cookie question, crumbles. I'm not ask it. From Leslie to Ross. Oh, God. What's your perfect Sunday? <laughs> Everybody's looking at me because we're recording this on a Sunday and they're hoping the answer is I'm enjoying playing role play games with all my friends on a my Sunday. My perfect Sunday is not role playing with you guys. I'm really sorry, but, <laughs> but it just isn't. It's fun, but not as fun as being on my sofa under a duvet in my pants, not having to be sociable after more than three hours sleep. Oh, I like yours. Yeah, I, I don't want to be on sorry, your sofa. Though. So what I'm saying is, don't feel bad about yeah. going. Not this. Yeah, well, we will not. We will not judge we all, you. We all pretty much want to be on Adam's sofa. You know, I'm really it's a good enjoy- sofa. Would that I'm be really weird? enjoying this five star Maldives hospitality with free drinks and food on tap and a gorgeous sunset in front of me. But I really wish I was crammed into a tiny room with four other role players drinking tea at well timed intervals. <laughs> so. With that <laughs> clarification, <laughs> having a lion followed by lots of board games, probably. Fair. Cool. Next question. Uh, from Blamed Cat, and this is to Adam. Is the adventure where you expected it to be by the end of this chapter? Hmm. That's a bit of a toughie for me, because the the truest answer is no. That's fair. We the, take up a lot of time. <laughs> well, it's because Port Haven, Port Haven. <laughs> ran on. <laughs> Essentially, be- I wonder why the the hunt, as I said either earlier this episode or last episode, was not scheduled. I prepped for it because I knew Oberon, but it wasn't actually an intended encounter. I had a rough idea what you're going to do, but it was very much a if this happens, then I'll go off on this tangent. Where the season ended was originally the midpoint of the season, and there was a lot more stuff planned that will now possibly happen in chapter three, but might not because more things have happened as we've gone along. From about episode four or five, when I revisited my original idea for this chapter and went, no, look, we're not going to get to this point. And also I think it would make a better... Because also the, the, the cost of the barroom was originally two episodes as well. That was scheduled for two or three episodes. Yeah, took um, seven, eight? Uh, eight. eight yes. Oh, no, longer. Longer, you... You got there in episode 10 and you got out... Yeah, seven episodes. Mm. Again, the vast majority of the cost of the barren was kind of pulled out of my arse as we went along because it the story developed as we were telling and it made... The story we were telling there was much more interesting than the story I'd originally written, if you get what I mean. So from about halfway... No, no is the answer. Up until <laughs> the point I went, this is a much better place to break. And at the point I kind of decided that's where we we're going to break, then that that was where I knew the chapter was going to be ending. Just the journey to get there took longer. Okay. Can I ask just very quickly, yeah. and you don't have to say 
any specific examples, but have there been moments where you are there, the equivalent of tapping your watch and your foot and going, oh, hurry up, come on, what are you doing here? Um, not in this game. Okay. Actually, no, because when we've been, it's either y'all role playing together which is the bit I love most about running a game, actually, is when I get to sit back for an episode and let you just argue amongst yourselves and chat. We do that. <laughs> or oh, yeah. I've episode been, 19. Yeah. Or I've been pouring on the action to keep it fast-paced. So, no, there's not really been any point where I've been sat here going, oh, just make a choice. Because if it starts to get that point for me, I flip a dark side point and bad things happen to you to force the action on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or I sit back and I let you talk amongst yourself because that is good radio. So, no, not not for this game. Other games I've ran, absolutely I have, but not for this show. Okay, next question. Uh, from Ren to Mim, which character is the most relaxing to play? Uh, I've got an idea of which it would be for me, but I'm curious. It's Roy, because Roy is Roy just responds to what's happening in front of him, whereas Lassa has been going through so much angst uh, and so much growth and stuff. Whereas, whereas Roy is just like, oh, this is happening now. Okay, so yeah, it, it's Roy. Not that I don't absolutely love playing Lassa because there's so much to get into, but Roy, I can just kick back and all of those little filters that you put on your brain to stop yourself saying stuff, you just take those off and let Roy come out and do his thing. It's brilliant. Um, next question is from Mr. Stewart to everyone. What do the characters want to be when they grow up? I don't know. <laughs> Better. Um, um, J- Jiren is grown up. Jiren's doing exactly what he wants to do. Yeah, Lass is definitely a grown up and, uh, and, and would look unkindly upon anyone who assumed that she was a young whippersnapper because that's what she looks at other people as uh, but she yeah she'd like to be in control of her own ship and her own uh, container shipping company okay next okay question. next question next question from j thunderific to everyone what style hilts would each character use if not the default style for um, lightsabers yeah we should clarify. okay um if everyone can figure out a way to to mount the lightsaber on the end of his rifle like a bayonet Tychus oh. already has. So you'll you'll be going. For not a spoiler. The, I'm not allowed to play with one, but you know you'll be going for the the rebels version with young. What's his name with the blue hair? Ezra. The, Ezra, the, the other yeah. way around though, because that's a lightsaber with a gun attachment. This would be a gun with a lightsaber, like a bayonet. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Bayonet. Yeah. I I oh, have. We we we've got a we've had a bit of a crafting session um for uh leading to shadows. Tychus has been melting some stuff, and I I have been looking into could I make a bayonet attachment for Clementine to mount the lightsaber on, but then I realised first of all that Tychus will not play with a lightsaber because it will absolutely upset Roy, and also he he ain't getting that back off K. So um <laughs> no you know, but great minds think alike there, Ed. I think yeah. Uh, Lassa, li- lightsabers are a bit cumbersome and unwieldy for her if anything she'd probably have a doctor who like sonic screwdriver she'd much rather have a mini lightsaber because it looks incredibly useful for cutting through bits of circuitry a laser and bread like knife. That. yeah basically she'd, she'd much rather have a practical functional one granny wellowax has an opinions on bread knives so yeah i can see where this goes yeah. <laughs> jiren would crack open the cumbersome horrible tubey death thing uh, take out the crystal and make it into an earring <laughs> Agatha's style would be more Wolverine style claws blade than, you know, actually holding the hilt in his hand because he's more punching things than elegant sword work at the moment. Oh, that would be disastrously wrong if you scratch yourself by accident. Or I think anything where you shower. scratch yourself wrong with a lightsaber is, yeah. <laughs> you just want a pair of, like, force field knuckle dusters, don't you? Because then you could literally plunge, punch the blade if you were fast enough with your bare hands. You've got Two force field nickel dusters, and you can just punch the blade, and they're like, there's no defense for that for for most Jedi because they're expecting another blade. Steel hand at it. Mm-hmm. Okay, moving on to the next question. From blamed cat to everyone, who is your favorite character? You can't pick your own, and why? If you don't want to pick, choose one thing a fellow player brings to the table that amazes you, and share it with the interwebs. It's a nice question. Uh, does it have to be a PC? Because Prinkle. There is so much love around this table for Prinkle. I think possibly, and I may be biased because I'm married to her, but I really like Lassa. And I like the way Lassa is struggling. It's it's an interesting story. And then again, I like them all as as characters. It's a bit of a cop-out, but they're all, they all bring different things to the table. I mean, you're all having serious emotional journeys, and I'm speaking in a silly accent and saying, hey, everybody, hello. It's just, it's nice. 
I like Jiren. I like Jiren's humor. I mean, the you know, I can't find my watch, was <laughs> which is one of the best moments. Um, I yeah. lost my cufflinks, but <laughs> whenever I'm hurt, I go into shock really quickly, mm. and I start talking nonsense. So I was just doing that. I I really like Agatha as a character for the rhythm that Agatha brings because it's like thing happens, thing happens. Agatha responds perfectly, one liner, move on. And he's just like. Yeah, no, and it's like you know, it's, oh, it's the lighthouse of the party, if you see what I mean. That particular character is just like, yeah, no, we know where we're going with this particular kind of interaction and story. Um, if Lassa knew where he was going, she would not be there. <laughs> well, well, there's that as well. Um, to answer the other question, the thing my fellow player brings to the table, Mikey, when he brings the tea. Oh, you know where the kitchen is. <laughs> I'm finding it quite fun to to go through the the serious hatred she's had of of Oberon's character, because there's oh there's clearly so many places you can take that character. There's an amazing redemption arc that that's there, and it's fascinating to watch. Uh, but it's really you know in a way quite enjoyable, whilst also being incredibly stressful, to absolutely have a nothing in common with your character, not even a oh, well, you know, we've all been out in space and we've all had to work a hard job or something like that. Even Jiren and Agatha, she could understand a little bit about, but but your character was just completely out the blue and going from being someone that she could mock to being someone that she was afraid of uh, to being someone that, out of character, I can see that there's good things happening, but I can't make her see it at the moment. So it's it's really weird place to be in and i like that i think that's going to be fascinating to watch as it goes on for me uh the, there's two so sorry for to the other half of you um <laughs> as i discussed in the table chat episode i love oberon's journey at the moment i really like the way that character's developing the other one is i think without jaren's humor this story especially the stuff on the cost of the bar run, would be too bleak it would be too dark because I'm aware that I, I'm telling quite a grim story compared to, which is not my usual GMing style. Normally I, I, I lean into whimsy and this, the Cold Fire Chronicles are not me leaning into whimsy. They are me telling various flavors of a horror story ultimately. Um, and I think without that humor to contrast the, the stuff I'm doing to you and the stuff you're doing to each other, I think this would be a far less entertaining show i think it would be too bleak so that that contrast i also i I think is essential really to to keep the mood light enough that doesn't bury people i think this is going to sound weird but i think if it wasn't for jaren we our characters mine agatha and oberon's would really struggle to communicate at certain points yeah because I think we've we've all thrown each other a curveball and we'd be someone that the other wouldn't interact with or wouldn't know how to approach uh, after having seen each other do certain things. But we can go via Jiren or, or to a lesser extent via Prinkle or um, Prijak. But yeah, I, th- I think Jiren's character is really important for allowing us to work together. So it's agreed I'm the captain, okay? <laughs> Captain Captain Sparkles clues in the door. Okay, I'm Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you promoted the cat, he's still Mister to everybody else. Where's the cat? Mutiny. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> it keeps like, happening. Who can explain it? I think the little cat bed on top of Tugger is going to become a little cat bed and a little cat throne, the little cat captain's chair with small directional things to program it until it, he's going to become like the emperor of the feline world God. Alter- alternating with a little cat cage as Jaren says no we're taking him to the vet mm-hmm. god emperor sparkles if you've ever caught Darth, Bra- Darth Vader breathing strangely careful it might be heavy purring <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh god that's ruined everything about that character now. <laughs> uh, next question this is from Paul Flowers and it's to everyone which tea is best for drinking whilst playing Star Wars? I'm going to go with... So, Adam. No, because <laughs> I don't drink tea. Right, next. <laughs> uh, we tend to just drink stock builder's tea, to be honest. But, I, I, I mean, I, I've got probably over 200 teas. But, you know, we're rushing through episodes, so we tend to just go standard. I prefer the stock builder's tea anyway. Yeah, I tend to go for just stock builder's tea. And when I'm writing as well, I tend to go for just something like Tetley or Typhoo. 
Uh, I'm very weak. Uh, if I'm if I'm drinking tea because I need tea, it'll be Russian caravan. Oh, I see. I have very strong opinions about this. Now, the only type of tea that one should really have is Punjab, which is nice. You don't need to use two tea bags to get a good, strong flavour of tea. And you don't end up with a weaker flavour of the tea by adding milk. You end up enhancing it. So preferably, it would always be Punjab tea stewed for about two minutes out of three. If I want a nice, strong tea, it will be something like Russian caravan mm-hmm. or one of the... Yeah, uh, Quill and Brothers do a whole range of really nice dark teas. Yeah, Smoky Lapso. Oh, yes. yes. Which we, we've got some. Next question. Okay. Um, this is from Lou to everybody. What characters do you usually play and why are you playing them now? We had to think about this earlier. I don't know if I have a type. My characters tend to be start off quite blank slate and become developed a lot later on. So far, as I've noticed. But... <laughs> I tend to default to supporting cleric style characters, especially if I'm not familiar with the group, uh, though I have recently enjoyed playing Paladins. Yeah, I think I'll probably play a bit fairly supporting as well, because I haven't taken the lead on almost anything we've done. I think I've got quite a wide variety of characters. Uh, coming from LARP, they all start, in a similar way to you, Ross, a bit of a blank slate. I create a character, and then I look at the the rules of the system to allow me to play that kind of character in that system. Mm. Um, But in in other games, I like playing the smart one. Uh, When I joined... So smart. Yeah. Oh, God, so smart until I roll a freaking dice. Uh, (laughs) That's the death of all of my character concepts, is my dice rolling. It's like, I'm super smart. I spent years studying to be a really intelligent sorcerer. I've just tripped over my own feet, bitten my tongue, and now I can't say a spell. Okay. Um, but no, I think that there's quite a big difference between Lasser and Roy, obviously. That mm. that feels quite big. Um, so I, I'm not sure I do have a type. I just like to see what happens. Jiren is fairly typical for me, but I don't really have a typical character. I mean, if we added them all up, I've played more bards than any other type of character, but I try and get away from all of that we have in our standard um weekend uh, crew quite a lot of quite charismatic people um we were, uh, uh, who will take the lead so you don't have to play the bard all the time we i mean k is not charismatic so we'll uh, and and uh, quite a lot of what i do in in other games um is kind of more sullen but uh, if i was to go with a slight increase in uh, in likelihood i would play a bombastic bird, yeah. I do have a mild confession to make, actually. I am that player. You know that player that plays that looks through the rule book and goes, can I do this? Mm-hmm. Uh, I am that player. Uh, most of the time I get away with it because I can pull it off. But if it was, for example, if it was the Dark Crystal TV series we were playing, I would want to play the Podling pa- Paladin. Yep. And I would ask very nicely, and typically the GM would trust me. And I would say, sorry, Mikey's already playing that character. <laughs> yeah, that, that is absolutely a Mikey character. Yeah, that's what I play. I I, I like failing. I, I would I would pick the role. I would pick the character race and mm-hmm. play it differently. There's a game that Mikey ran where because uh, the NPC was such a Mikey character. I kept forgetting that he was running the game and kept thinking he was another player. You with keep that. thinking it's Adam's game. I keep thinking it's yeah. Adam's game, yeah. and it's like, oh, actually, no, I remember role playing with Adam as well. Yeah, but uh, but that yeah. you know he, he he has certain types I think that are just him, and it's normally something with a silly voice. I love silly voices. Well, Kay's not got a silly voice. Kay just sounds like me. No, but Kay, Kay is serious yeah, for he you. Is. Very much so. Okay, um, and I'm not going to answer because I'm not playing in this one. I'll answer it when we when the question reoccurs in shadows. There we go. Um, next question is from Lou to everyone. What is the optimum number of Legomorphs? Are they the profiteroles of space mammals? They're not that tasty. I'll, I'll, I'll answer this, and, and nobody else is going to understand, so I'm just going to answer to Lou. We have um, the right amount of, um, of Legomorphs for any given situation. So, uh, Corfani crew currently doesn't have any. Shadows crew has three. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry about this. I, I've got this. They're not like Profiteroles of Space because I believe there is a potential to have too many Legomorphs, but it's impossible to have too many Profiteroles. So, no. No, they're not. We're, but who knows? We might find something that is the profit of in space going forward. I think it's like ferrets. The optimum number of Legomorphs is, for comedy purposes, however many limbs you have to hold those Legomorphs, <laughs> plus one. 
<laughs> so you can do that as a mathematical calculus to work out if you have enough leg morphs. So if a tiger's at seven. No, I can't hold them with my feet. <laughs> well, you said limbs. <laughs> limbs to hold them with. I don't have foot baskets. I'm not a Doug. I don't have like grippy toes. Oh, Doug, Doug's. Doug's. Friends, if Roy held you, you could hold uh, six and then we'd need seven. And that seventh would inevitably end up being on top of someone's head or chewing something uh, inappropriate. <laughs> Just like ferrets. Next question. I might have to adapt this question slightly. From Malhazel. Or Malhazel. That's the one. Okay. He, he's, he's not an elven paladin. Malhazel. Malhazel. <laughs> Friend with Ra's al Ghul. <laughs> oh, for ages I thought Zin Pandel was from the Lord of the Rings and not wide. <laughs> from Malhazel to everyone. If you could cast one actor of stage or screen into your next game session, what would, who would it be and why? By next game session, we're saying the next coal fire game session. Depends on plot at this point. I'm not I will sure. leave it to your interpretation. I have an answer that, that fits either game because they'd fit anywhere because they're awesome, which would be Ryan Blessed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we could certainly afford him. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, there are some brilliant celebrities who, who do tabletop gaming. I mean, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, mm. uh, Vin <laughs> Diesel, uh, people like that who it would be really interesting to see what their gaming style is like. But otherwise... If we ever to get anybody, we get James Earl Jones because that means we'll have Darth Vader on our podcast and everybody will listen to it. See, there's a lot of British scene comedians that I could think of that I would love to, love to like play games with, and I know that they're geeks, and I know that there's a lot of British scene authors who also play tabletop games, uh, that I'd love to just play games with. But I think that's different than having an actor turn up. Uh, I think it'd be really interesting because of their work in in improv, and I think they were in because uh, I think they were part of the Cambridge Footlights for a while. Obviously, it'd be Stephen Fry because there's a lot of performance there, and I think he, I think he might enjoy it. It would be interesting. I also don't think he'd be so funny as to derail a game because occasionally, again, if anyone's ever done improv, occasionally you'll find someone who will ruin a scene for a one line gag. And it's funny at the time, but if you keep doing that, you've not got a scene and no one else, you have to constantly try and build something new. So having someone who can know when to do the gag and it's worth stopping the scene for a minute to do the gag and having someone who could build into that world and that improvised uh, setting. And I get the feeling he'd do quite well. Hugh Laurie as well, because again, brilliant actor. Could be very interesting. Lots of funny voices. While we're on the topic, Paul Foxcroft, the British comedian, yeah, does uh, a show called Questing Time, which is essentially him running a tabletop campaign. Mm-hmm. And he's amazing. So yeah, Paul would be good. Oh, Dan Harmon, Matt Mercer, if you're free and you fancy yeah. coming over and visiting, we've got tea. Uh, <laughs> and we have ferrets and cats, which is going to make for an interesting new gaming experience for you. So, From Ren to Adam, how dare you? <laughs> how very dare, dare you? <laughs> oh, we'd seen the question. We didn't know who was going to draw it. <laughs> because I can and because I should. So this is from Mal Hazel, and to everyone, when did you guys first get gaming together, and which game was it? Uh, well, me and Mikey have been role-playing together for about 20 years, yeah, and that was uh, a LARP called Song of Steel, mm-hmm. um, which is a Manchester-based uh, LARP that tragically died a few years ago. Yeah. Um, but that that's where we first started. I have absolutely no idea what our first tabletop was. Or no. indeed, how long it was after we started LARPing before we started tabletopping. I want to say it was probably at, at the uh, at the shop in Manchester. I imagine. Oh God, was it that far back? Yeah, yeah it was, wasn't it? Um, Translation: They old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which again, actually, probably will have been nearly twenty years back. Uh, I used to run a gaming club, and we we had about thirty or forty people that came, mm-hmm. and we ran games of uh, four players and one GM yeah. and six week stints. And every six weeks you rotated who was playing what and who was running what with sign up sheets. So we played an awful lot of short arcs with an awful lot of people. And it will have been somewhere in that with Mim. The first game we played together was probably Mikey's fifth ed or my Genesis. It was fairly recent it was within the last couple of years. It was about 2016. Yeah. So about three years ago, because I moved up here in 2015, and I'd met um, Adam, Ed, and Mikey at a a large festival LARP game called Maelstrom. Uh, But it had been very much sort of 
You know, when you briefly role play with someone because you might need to go and buy something off someone or you'll say hello and have a drink, but you're not really engaged with the mm. people. Uh, but then, yeah, sitting down and role playing over at Adam's house. So oh, actually, would it have been? It was my Dragon Age game. That was the first one you joined. It was my Dragon Age campaign. Really? Yeah, I think it was. Did we not run Fate before that? No. Okay, um, it was Fate after. Fate was after. Yeah. It was a Dragon Age game with... It is with... with you two, Mori- Cartman and Lee. Moribond. Yeah, Moribond. Yeah. Who, again, because when you're joining a brand new roleplay group, occasionally you're a little bit, oh, I don't know how to roleplay with these people. And I hadn't done a lot of tabletop. I'm a LARPer, not a tabletopper. Um, although I am now, one now. Uh, so I went in and my character was based off how I felt. I was going to be a young, um, kind-hearted, sort of, optimistic character that was going to go off on adventures and if you don't know the difference between whether a character has film cinematic rules for violence versus realistic rules for violence you can really make an impression with your character (laughs) if you think that you're going to be doing the the comedic film version of smashing a bottle over someone's head where they go a bit dizzy and sit down and then you find out that what you've actually done is smash a glass bottle over someone's head cut them up terribly ruin your own hand and look like a mental in front of everybody a proper psychopath it was um yeah it it was the latter not the former yes (laughs) And uh, first time with Ed was, again, probably lapping at Maelstrom. And first time with Ross is this podcast. Yep, yep. same yep. here for Ed and Ross, this so, podcast. Uh, 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 no, uh, we've, um, apart, Adam, yes, Paranoia. Coldfire Chronicles. We play, I played Paranoia with the rest of you. Yeah, I ran a Paranoia oh, game. Oh, yeah, we did one Paranoia game. That was about game. three years ago, to, I yeah. think. So uh, I, t- I nicked someone's broom and tried to get them in trouble. Yeah. Prinkle? That sounds about right. <laughs> Mim touched on it, but the first time I met Mim, I uh, didn't richly sacrifice her. Um, you keep saying oh. that more than I think <laughs> we need you to. Ed. You are nothing. Oh, where did the scum. inspiration for Oberon come from? Oh, I think we can um, see it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I was I was playing with a lot of um, shall we say older larpers, and we all decided to play good to to, to lean towards evil. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of interacted with a lot of people, but also had a lot of my friends running away from me, which was, which was fun. I remember meeting you because you were really condescending because I was a plains Ophidian. Uh, so I was kind of like, we move around and we chill and you were a, a, an Hanathan, much more temple builders and proper civilization and we did not like each other at all and I first met my wonderful husband because uh, uh, he was a golem and I was a snake and he met me at my old whipping stall <laughs> um, all of this is being he asked me whipped I said I need a chisel and he didn't come back for a bit but we got on really well after that and kept chatting. going back to the question about musical episode no <laughs> <laughs> Aww. When I first met Mike, he, he in a lot of context, he was a large black and white cat. Oh, yes. Uh, he's since got better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have got a distinct feeling that when I met Adam, he had his top off. Yeah, that sounds it, about right. It sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the rest of it has, again, in a lot of context. So, LARP is the short answer to that. And again, Paranoia, uh, we played as a group. Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know Ross through the Black Library. Mm-hmm. Which is not an extra dimensional library where the Eldor store their books, but is in fact. Well, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But it's in fact Games Workshop's uh, brand of books. Okay. Next question. Okay. From Rill to the whole cast. Who's the next most likely to lose the next lost body part, and who's most likely to lose it? Uh, Duran again. <laughs> Same arm. <laughs> <laughs> So we found the following episode by Pringle where it was dropped behind the yeah, sofa. Uh, it, I, I left it somewhere. Uh, just Because you've got to unplug them to charge them at night, right? I can answer this. It'll be Agatha, your head, while you're sleeping, if you ever try and throw Lasser again. <laughs> it is getting to that point where retaliation is... I could just I could just shoot you. <laughs> I'm sure, <Yeah>. quietly. <laughs> so so um, there's a question that's going to be coming up. Um, yeah, don't give us lightsabers. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look at me. I can juggle these. Vroom. Oh, dear. So, next question? Yeah, next question. This is from Mr. T to Adam. The characters don't have lightsabers, uh, which I find uh, superfluous for the story arc you're telling. Was this a decision from uh, the start of the campaign or just something that hasn't happened yet? A uh, decision from the start of the campaign. It, it wasn't the sort of story I wanted to tell. I, I'm i still umming and ahhing about whether or not the crew will get lightsabers 
But currently my inclination is no, because as soon as they're introduced, it changes the dynamic of the story of their relationships and also of their threat response quite dramatically. And yeah, I just don't think it, I'm not saying they'll never get them, but I'm it, they're currently it's not my intention. Sorry, everyone. They're so iconic and so viewed as so powerful. They do change all everything as soon as you get one. There's there's so much to do with them. What colour is it? What style of it? Did you build it yourself? How did you get it? How does it impact your fighting style? It changes a lot of things very quickly. It's not the right sort of campaign for it, really, I don't think. We Yeah, we do a very different take on how you use a lightsaber. Because uh-huh. mostly we'd be, right, and we cut through that door, and then we charge through it and punch them. We're kind of an edge of the Empire campaign, but with magic. Mm. <laughs> Lassa would just be like, okay, fantastic. So all I have to do is get on a ship and put my lightsaber through it to ruin the ship forever. Well, we could do that. We could well, just... <laughs> yeah, we tactically make holes in walls rather than actually hit opponents. Yeah. We're the lost children of the Force. We, we aren't Jedi. Mm-hmm. And like it's not a, it's not a Jedi Sith story. It's what happens when when people who have great power don't, and no responsibility, and no responsibility, <laughs> don't know what to do with it. Yeah, which is a more interesting story. Yeah, definitely. So, next question uh, from Le Ma- Meander Falls to everyone. Hi, Meander Falls. Hi, Meander Falls. If the gang could fire any one of the other members slash characters out of the torpedo tube. Who would they ploop out of it? Agatha, because Agatha would enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, and we could very much make Agatha believe that it was for a good reason. I, when we had the previous question about the reality TV show, I was holding quiet. I'm not going to suggest. And who would we vote off? Because I knew the um, answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have a torpedo tube on the ship. So, Give we Lassa got an afternoon. <laughs> just, uh, Hijack knows how to work them. Uh-huh. No, you can just picture, you know, Jiren saying, now there's a very good reason for this, and tying on this little helmet with stars on onto Agatha. And he's like, no, this is perfect. It's going to look amazing, okay? No, I, can to- I can totally see it working, though. There's like a Vindicator class Star Destroyer. We've got no other choice, and Agatha just goes up and goes, let me punch it. <laughs> so bring, oh. Breathing mask, helmet, Wolverine lightsabers. Yeah. Just oh, no, yeah, this is the this is the Colossus throws Wolverine maneuver. Yeah. Only we're, only Fast with Agatha. Ball special out of spaceships. So, so how how do you? We ha- would totally do that. How, how do you get me back? No, don't ask questions that I can't answer. The, just get in the tube. We'll get to that bridge when we cross it. Oh, we're totally doing that. <laughs> well, we are going to tie your legs together with this rope. <laughs> When we hit light speed, hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Uh, we just got to get Agatha over his fairest dark, the dark and you know, space suits. That's, that's all right. Light. We just give you a torch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am doomed. <laughs> one one torch in the entirety of space. Okay. Remember, Oberon got back okay when it happened to him. It'd be fine for you. <laughs> Next question uh, from Blamed Cat to everyone. Name one thing that surprised you this chapter. Uh, the ending. I I hadn't thought about it being uh, Pijak's mentor about being cold fire. I, I didn't see that coming. I'd just forgotten about it. We had other things to worry about. So that that was a surprise. Three triumphs in a round. Yeah. yeah. That surprised me. Uh, yeah. P- pulling your arm off. Yeah. That yeah. was that was good though. Jerry losing his arm and the fact that that was the only limb we lost. <laughs> Well, you did try. You know, tried very really, hard to lose and, me. Yeah, and the fact that Agatha didn't collapse of all of his wounds because he really tried on that one. Uh, so did I, but, you know. <laughs> me too. I didn't heal him at all. <laughs> Definitely. No, no J. Ren's the only one who kept him awake. <laughs> Definitely a farewell to arms uh, mm. and the entire temple scene. By arms, are you referring to J. Ren or are you referring to uh, your gun which got blasted to pieces in the next episode? Both were a tragedy. <laughs> uh, next question uh, is from Blame Cat to everyone. Name one skill or talent that you wished you had during this chapter. Oh. Survival. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, uh, I wish I hadn't said I was afraid of the dark in season one. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, because that was fun. But <laughs> I kind of wish I was playing more of a law-based character. But then I always do that because that's the kind of characters I like to play. So yeah, but no, because I'm 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 kind of glad that I'm a bit ignorant. Yeah, I I don't think there is anything because I like the, the 
I like the gaps in Jaren's knowledge. I like the fact he's not doesn't understand computers at all. I like the fact that I'm not very good at X, Y, and Z. So I, I think it would be a different character if I had other skills. I could do with a little bit more padding, a little bit more soak damage, possibly. <laughs> Uh, if I had the ability to, to sidestep or something, that would be nice. Mm. Uh, just because uh, <laughs> she's a terrible shot. She's not designed to get into combat, but she uh, she does. Exactly in the wrong place. It's like when she had to jump down and cut the power cables. It's like, well, you could just stay here and shoot. There is no way I'll get it shooting. I've got to get in there. Mm. Otherwise, it's just a waste of a dice roll. And knowing that it could kill me, but it was the only way. I have a question from Jay Dry to Mim. Hi, Jay. If Roy was to visit a zoo or some sort of pet shop, how long would it take before he got banned? Oh, I think it would be pretty quickly um, because if he was there with Tykus, for example, the Banjalele and the educational songs would be coming out and people would be learning a lot of things that they probably didn't want their kids to know about uh, <laughs> the animals in the zoo um other than that he'd just be very enthusiastic a lot of people don't like droids as well so depending on on how droidist the zoo owners are you know they're not always welcome do we have any more questions yep i've got one more this is from blamed cat to everyone if there was one thing that you wish played out differently what would it be i think i'd like um tenth brother not to be who he is (laughs) because <laughs> because that's going to be awkward in the next chapter um because we're still going to have to search for him but we're not going to find him like it when we find him or maybe we're not going to have to search for him it really depends on how it goes but it's made things very complicated and that would have been nice to have been able to bypass that complication it's an interesting question for Auburn because a lot of it is about him figuring out like the obvious his obvious answer would be his entire childhood and when he figures out that that's the wrong answer then he'll be a better person um yeah i'd like lassa not to have been on that droid when i got through it but it was good for the story lassa would like to have not to have been on that droid <laughs> when agatha... no, from lassa's perspective in a way it's the entire relationship with agatha because it's changed so dramatically and i really wish she could uh, find something to bring her back into the group uh, to bring her uh, at the very least into being able to to deal with all of all of those characters being being a bit of a disappointment to her I suppose because because we're, we're not heroic and we're not organized and we don't work as a team uh, and, and that's a bit a bit harsh for her uh, and so the the relationship that she thought she would have with Agatha is is gone completely out the window. Uh, I kind of I kind of wish uh, she could find a way to to see some of the amazing stuff that 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 me and Ross actually spoke about when we were talking about his character one day. We sat mm. down for a really long time and had a really great chinwag. And there's so much in Agatha that I don't think has always come out. And it can occasionally be really hard knowing that oh, that there's this stuff about his character that we're waiting for the moment for it to be shown. We're we're waiting for him to be given the opportunity to really put those character ideas out there. So it's in a way, I really wish that me and him could be friends because it's very hard being at everyone's throat apart from Jaren's. Because Jaren's annoying to get on with. Let's face it, he's far too charming and charismatic. You're just jealous because I'm amazing. No, we've had this conversation a couple of times with Adam because my, my approach to playing Agatha has not jumped into the story a lot because he doesn't say a lot. Um, so that's been one major problem of it. And But we did say at the end of season one, the, just the fact that Agatha terrified Lassa in the net just where we were getting on board the Colfizers in the first place, this was going to have consequences. It has... We just want to get to what the next bit of the story is. <laughs> that so might we're, have, that we're looking might forward have, to the next chapter again, aren't we? <laughs> that might have had consequences. Uh, it, it, it's then... It's just been fr- exacerbated. We've just made it worse. <laughs> yes, with every single thing you've done. <laughs> and that's the thing. There's, it's not... There hasn't been one moment where it's gone all... Oh, like Oberon's kind of had his one moment where Agatha uh, uh, Lassa went, no, this is something I really can't 
get a handle on. This is real cruelty that I don't understand where it comes from. So I can't make allowances for it or work it. It's something deeply wrong in in Oberon's character. Uh, and with you, with Agatha's character, it's just, it's gone from, there's not even something deeply wrong. There's just something missing I mean, in the emotional that whiplash, makes you dangerous. We, there's emotional whiplash because we were bonding over the heights and depths and then we went on to the cost of the barn and then it went wrong again. So it's... Uh, it's very a little. It's varied a lot for me, but I, I, I don't think we've had any bonding opportunities in the entirety of this season because of the way, uh, the way Agatha responds to all the situations we've been in is generally to do what Agatha sees. So mm. he doesn't ask questions of the group as to what our plan is or what's going on. Agatha does Agatha, and when Agatha does Agatha my character gets hurt so so no there's been no bonding because every time it's been a case of oh well now we're, we're sitting because we're in a ship and she has to deal with you but that doesn't mean that uh she she's enjoying having to deal with your character because it's just a whole load of issues for her she can't trust you she mm. can't preempt your movements uh, she can't expect you to communicate with her so just you're stay in the workshop where it's safe and where agatha doesn't actually come to you either <laughs> See, and I have this really weird mental image of suddenly JRN going, let's all do something together to, to get together. And we all go to DeepCon, the Heights and Depths con- convention. And of course, Tenth Brother turns up, but everyone confuses him as a cosplayer for a character from season 14. And it all gets a bit wacky. So uh, let, yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> JRN oh. did, did kind of set up a, a day out bonding activity for us. It was this weird hunt thing that happened. Uh, that, that, I mean, to be fair, uh, that was that was Oberon. All right, I made it happen. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. as far as you're aware, Oberon wanted to do it. Yeah, j idea was much better because that's what j did the night before. Yeah, I wanted us to go, go for a Doug Masseuse. Mm, dogs. Right, well, I think that about brings <laughs> us to a close. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. Uh, thank you to the cast. And we will see the rest of you next time for not the Shadows of the Jedi, I'm afraid. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we return to Cinebale. We will be taking you on a day in the life of everyone's second favourite Chadra fan as he has a little exciting adventure of his own in Prinkle's Excellent Adventure. We hope you enjoy it and we will see you there. Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Fantasy Flight Games and Lucas Books. Our intro music for the rest of this season is Superpower Cool Dude by Kevin MacLeod, and our outro music remains Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale, both used with gratitude under the Creative Commons license. A number of our ambient sounds and sound effects are provided by Sirenscape, because epic games deserve epic sounds. For episode-specific credits for music, please see the show notes and also the credits page of our website at forcemajeurepod.com. If you like the show and want to support us, there's a few ways you could do that. The first is by rating and reviewing wherever you find us, be it iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever. That helps other people find us and lets us know that we're telling the sort of stories that you enjoy hearing. We do have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash forcemajeurepod and also a coffee account at ko fi i.com slash force majeure pod if you've got some change burning a hole in your pocket i want to throw it our way we appreciate all the support we do have social media presences the easiest way to find us is on twitter at force majeure pod we do also have a facebook page and an instagram page and a discord server links to all of these are contained in the show notes come along and talk nonsense with us we always like to hear from fans of the show and until next time may the force be with you